In this section, Stephen outlines his vision for future learning and the importance of developing the key skills and competences in both students and teachers for learning and living in a fast-changing world. It was critical, in his view, to move away from the concept of the single-cell box as the predominant model for delivering education to students. In a school context, what does that mean? It means that there, there are some fundamental shifts occurring. And I heard a really good quote in two British schools in the last couple of weeks, and they're pretty powerful. Yeah, the the democratisation of learning has already occurred. It's not that it's going to occur, it has already occurred. When the internet occurred, the democratisation of learning occurred. That means that no longer can any teacher try and control the learning of their class because it's within the power of the individual to learn by themselves. That's a pretty powerful thought when you think it through and that has immense implications for school design because no longer can we ever think that the single cell box is going to work again. And, and some of, these are some of the fundamental shifts, you know, from control to empowerment. You know, if you look at the, um, the British and the Australian prison system, that's all about control. I've been to Iceland and the 12 prisoners one year back in 2007 that were in jail in Iceland were sent home on the weekends on programs to empower them to achieve to relearn how to live going through. It was interesting. It's from management to engagement, um, all of those other ones, from static to mobile, batch to personal, from teacher to teams. That is probably the one that architects need to most start to understand. No teacher has ever gone through any course in the world, as far as I can discover, which has taught them how to collaborate. They go through and they are taught how to write your own program, how to be supervised separately, how to then cope with the stress of an argument with a parent or a student separately. The entire teaching paradigm and the teacher training is about separation. And that is a problem for any person that builds an open space for teachers because they will immediately try and separate off in that space going through. Um, then there has to be an end product to the education. So as we think about the purpose, social cohesion, community development, job creation, future oriented, you know, then that has to be taking, that has to have an influence on the building design. And, and many schools actually then do have a you know, strategic plan for five years. They might even have a development plan which marks out the ovals and the new buildings or whatever else they're going to do. But they actually don't have a pedagogic vision or plan going through. And the crazy thing is that if a child starting school now is not going to graduate from university until the middle of the 2030s. I look at our school and there are three generations of technology users within our school all of a sudden. The kids who are aged three in preschool through to about seven in, in early primary are very good with, with um, anything to do with interactive surfaces. In fact, there are fingerprints all over a room because they're just going to see does it move. That's how they actually approach life. And, and they're fearless. You know, you just press that, you press that, you press that, you press that, and then you remember how you did it, and then you go on next time and you do it again. And their parents have been shutting them up in the car with a mobile phone, or they've been saying, you know, someone's called around here, play with this. That, that's their world. And from eight-year-olds to about 13-year-olds, they've lived in a world where they've actually been told to make a blog, or to use Edmodo, or to use Weebly, and they're very comfortable applying web tools to their work. But then you get the sort of 14 to 19-year-olds, and their world has been social media. So they actually don't know how to use a web page, they're a bit hesitant about the implications of a, an interactive tablet for their own learning because all they can do is Facebook, MySpace perhaps in the past, but they're, and the other smart messengers and whatever else they're going to be using these days. So well, I guess the, my, the message I'd give any government now is if we, if we try and constrain learning, and I know that that's happening in the UK at the moment because a year ago everyone was complaining about Michael Gove and what he was doing, but now they're sort of making comments about the the complexity of the Ofsted structures and how that's forcing him to do things and exactly the same is happening in Australia with, with our, with our um, approaches, what's, what's going there. The crazy thing is we actually have the opportunity to invent the future rather than prevent it and the more we're constrained the more it will be prevented. Um, so what's the agenda for future learning? Well I'd say it's all about vision, it's about culture shaping, that's the key one that you've actually you have to shape a culture. Now our kids are born into a world where media messages come to them every day from, you know, from multiple thousands of sources. If we as adults don't counteract that with a very, very 
deliberate strategy for shaping the learning culture in a school, well, the learning culture will never overtake the other cultures. So therefore, if there's a problem with behaviour or management or outcomes, the answer is actually shaping the learning culture. And that might mean working with parents, it might be working in houses, it might be working with other things. Collaboration is then the name of the game. Flexibility, mobility, adaptability and creativity, they're all, that's all part of the future. And we've got to align those things together. You can't actually have them actually all in separate worlds. So our role in what we've been doing in skill is to connect pedagogic thinking and space with physical space, virtual space and cultural space. So all of our classrooms actually have a virtual classroom, version of the classroom. But at every point of the day, the language that we create around learning is helping to shape the, the culture. So that as our kids walk into the school, we're not saying, you know, we think soccer culture is awful. We're actually saying that we actually quite like that. But you know, as you walk in the gate, suddenly the culture that's predominant is learning. So what could the new pedagogy look like? Well, it's highly collaborative. But the problem here is teachers have never been taught how to collaborate. <coughs> so, so therefore, we've struggled with the open school designs from the 1960s and 70s. And how many parents and teachers still say, oh, you know, don't go back to that because it was noisy. That's where we need the acoustic engineers. That, that, that's what <laughs> just talking with Andrew beforehand. If there's anything that's critical in a refurb or a new building, it's acoustic engineers. And I've, I've learnt that through our work because it makes an incredible difference. But the concept of how do you collaborate, the, the simple question there is any person who's done an MBA or worked in a joint practice has lived collaboration all of their professional lives. Teachers have never experienced that. And if they actually move into an executive structure, it's all about hierarchy. I've got the, you know, I've, I've got the, the power to tell you what to do because I'm going to supervise you. And Ofsted can come in and they can supervise us or they can fail us or whatever else. It's all about hierarchy going through. We've actually reinvented it and, and this is what we're doing. The best analogy here, um, it, it's just as if the teachers are a, a, a football team or a netball team and the play is the ball. So in that classroom of 180, the teachers come onto the field and someone's going to start off the action. Now the other staff aren't standing around doing nothing. They are continually looking to see what's about to happen and they all position themselves around for the spontaneous interactions, for the immediate workshops, for whatever else they have to do. And they're going to be moving to where the action's going to be, not where it is now. Now you don't go running to where the ball was, you go to where the ball's going to go, going through. So you've actually got to then get the shared language, you've got to get the high trust going. You've got to Everything's got to become modular in design so that you can reshape it and change it. That comes from the curriculum to the spaces to, you know, you've got to share how do you, how do you grow a new unit. It's got to be modules. Um, it's got to be clearly owned and it's got to be highly professional. That's a, that's a challenging one because, I mean, I've been a member of the teaching union for many years as part of my teaching career, but then how do you actually match an agenda from a union with the professionalism, with the government, You've actually got to, we've got to forge a new way ahead. It's as simple as that. I mean, it's, I know that there'd be a lot of unionists who get very, very angry with me for saying that, but really when it comes down to it, no one has taught teachers how to collaborate. And if we think genuinely that the future of learning is about innovation and creativity, we have to learn to collaborate. So therefore, we've got to reteach ourselves in that process, and collaboration takes time. So the whole old model was all about separation. Separate rooms, separate and separated educators, separated class groups, separate desks, chairs, rows, separate preparation. It was separate. The new one is about learning. It's about design. It's about taking risks. It's about opportunity. And it's about taking action. 